Buonasso. So I promised to read you a parable each day. <laughs> and I got so carried away this morning, and whatever was said, I can't quite remember. But I forgot the parable. So let's have a short parable. It's quite a nice one. I remember this one. Rinpoche taught it more than 20 years ago. I still remember. We remember stories. At least I remember stories. It's a good story. So this is on page 89, the parable of an old man losing his cord. Oh, one minute. No, no, something before that. We have two, one before that. Oh, one before that, yeah, okay. So page 88, 88. the old man losing cord is good, we'll get to that. But here's another one, a short one on page 88. So once in the land of India there was a great king who passed away, leaving behind an orphaned son. A minister abducted the child and abandoned him to a band of idiots. The orphan became utterly destitute in terms of his clothing, food, and lodging, and he became indistinguishable from the idiot's children. Eventually, a Brahmin examined his features and recognized that he was endowed with the fine characteristics of the royal class, of royalty. He bathed the child with scented water, burned fine incense, clothed him with fine garments, adorned him with fine ornaments, placed him on a high throne, and appointed him as the sovereign of the kingdom. Thus, in an instant, he arose in the royal family of the entire region, and all his subjects experienced joy and happiness. That's very straightforward. So here's a brief commentary. Likewise, the ultimate reality of your own mind has been primordially present as the spontaneous or spontaneously actualized Dharmakaya. It's Hlundup when you say spontaneous. Nowadays I translate it as spontaneously actualized. It's more literal, I think more accurate too. The ultimate reality of your own mind has been primordially present, always present, as the spontaneously actualized Dharmakaya, but it has been obscured <coughs> by adventitious contaminations, and without recognizing it, you have wandered in the cycle of existence. Upon receiving the blessings of a holy guru, you are introduced to it, and upon identifying your mind as primordial, primordially present as the Dharmakaya, you are liberated from the sufferings <coughs> of wandering in samsara. So this is actually it's a very simple story, and I think I'll read actually one more. Uh, it's a very simple story, but it actually points to something really quite crucial. And that this is <clears throat> a parable of receiving so-called pointing out instructions. And if the, the Lama is very accomplished, has the ability to, to give this kind of, they call it sometimes a mind-to-mind -mind transmission, if the Lama is capable, and the students are ripe, they're receptive, they're open, they're well prepared, then the pointing out instructions may be given, and right there, the disciple may have some, again, like a break in the clouds, probably won't become a vidyadhara at this time, but might have some genuine insight, veiled, okay, so, but still veiled, but still an insight into rikpa, into realizing one's own mind, or the deepest dimension of one's own mind, that's the jitata, as dharmakaya. And so you have that possibility in an instant, like the child who was kidnapped and then was retrieved, in an instant of, to use kind of a cliché term, dropping down. And it is kind of a descent. The coarse mind descends at the substrate, and when the substrate shatters, when you cut through it, then the locus of your awareness descends to the ground, pristine awareness, which is nothing other than Dharmakaya. And so then you know for yourself that your Buddha nature is not simply potential, a potential for something good to happen in the future, but it is <clears throat> an actual reality. So it exi exists in the realm of actuality and not only in the realm of possibility. <clears throat> so this is a distinction especially between the Dzogchen and the New Translation Schools, Tsongkhaba's writings, Galupa tradition as a whole. And in, in Vajrayana practice, in the Galupa tradition, and that's where I was trained for the first 20 years, so I, I think I'm somewhat familiar with it. Um, when you, for example, practice Vajrasattva, was the first 
Vajrayana practice I was ever introduced to. You you develop your, <clears throat> you take refuge, you take bodhicitta, you cultivate bodhicitta, and then, to the best of your ability, you imagine dissolving all phenomena, of course, including the environment, your body, your mind, and yourself, dissolving all into emptiness. So you must have some awareness of the constructed, conceptually constructed nature of the whole of reality, and very much in the center of the mandala, your own identity. You dissolve that into emptiness. But but it's not just emptiness. It's not just flat emptiness. Like there's the here's a piece of paper. The paper is empty of inherent nature. Okay. So you could realize emptiness by realizing the emptiness of the piece of paper. You could, right? But that's all there is to it. It's just emptiness. It is a sheer absence of inherent nature of the paper. Go into your mind. I'm speaking now of as somebody who has a little familiarity with the Dzogchen tradition. Go into your mind. Realize the empty nature, emptiness of inherent nature of your own mind. Now what's left? Is there anything more than a sheer absence of inherent nature of your own mind? Is there anything more? Kirsty? Yes. What would that be? If you get a wrong answer, it doesn't make any difference. But it's still awareness. What kind of awareness? Yeah, more specifically, jazz. Um, knowing. Yeah, more specifically, Alan. Uh, luminosity, clarity. More specifically, Sebastian. Rikpa, emptiness. Say again? Rikpa, emptiness. Rikpa. Yeah, Rikpa, Buddha nature. You're all right. But everything you said is equally true of the conventional. Consciousness on the surface level. It's luminous, it's clear, and all of that. Now, when you've realized the emptiness of your own awareness, in emptiness, shunya nature, the emptiness of inherent nature of your own mind, there's not only the emptiness, but there's a mode of awareness there that is rikpa. It does not mean that if you realize emptiness that you've necessarily realized rikpa, but it does mean there's something more to the emptiness of your mind beyond the emptiness of a piece of paper. Because a piece of paper does not have Buddha nature. And your mind does. Your mind is. Buddha nature is the ground state. And so if you should fathom this paper all the way to the ground, the nature of the piece of paper is not Dharmakaya. It's Dharmadhatu, but it's not Dharmakaya. Right? Realize the nature of your own mind right down to the ground, and that's Chittata. That's, that's the indwelling mind of clear light indwelling mind of clear light. That's Rikpa. That's Dharmakaya. That's Buddha nature. Right. And so, in the Galupra tradition, since you know we, we've now finished with Penchen's text, so here's a footnote to Penchen Ramach's text. In the whole Galupra tradition, you say, Om Svabhava Shuddha Savadhamma Svabhava Shuddha Ham. Om, the nature of all phenomena is emptiness, and that emptiness am I, or that purity am I. But it's not just I am emptiness. It's not just I am the absence of inherent nature. That is Dharmadhatu, that's Shunya, but it's indivisible from Dharmakaya. That's the primordial indivisibility of Dharmakaya, Dharmadhatu. And that am I. Shudoham, I am that purity. Now, if you're approaching this, and, and when I say this, I mean that this has been proven effective so many times, if anybody disparages this, you don't know what they're talking about. Uh, when you do this, from the Galuper's perspective, you're approaching the practice from the perspective of being a sentient being, which is certainly a true perspective. And then you dissolve your sense of identity into emptiness. You imagine, and if you can realize emptiness, great. Uh, but then you imagine that emptiness being indivisible from Dharmakaya, and out of that non-duality of Dharmakaya, Dhammadhatu, then you arise the deity and you think, I am Vajrasattva. Or let's say, I am Avalokiteshvara. Let's go there. That's a public, a public Dharma, right? You think, I am Avalokiteshvara. Well, Avalokiteshvara is a Buddha, manifesting a tenth-stage Bodhisattva, but is a Buddha, right? The very embodiment of the compassion of all the Buddhas, right? From a Galupa perspective, you kind of take a step, step back and say, is this true? The answer is, no, you're not a Buddha. 
you're a sentient being. But you're not inherently a sentient being, and you do have the potential of perfect enlightenment. So even though you're not a Buddha, as skillful means, because this is very useful, this is a very useful technique, it's a skillful means, imagine that you are Buddha. And imagine that you're Buddha. Now proceed in the practice. In the back of your mind, are you a Buddha? You know, Mary Kay, me, Jodi, are you a Buddha? Is there any, is there kind of some percentage of you that's actually Buddha? And the answer is zero percent. I can't speak for Jodi or Mary Kay, but I can speak for myself. Alan Wallace, this guy here, is there some percentage of me that's a Buddha? The answer from a Galoop perspective is no. <coughs> zero. I have zero Buddha qualities. <coughs> I have 100% qualities of a sentient being. I'm like a made-to-order, like fully bona fide, absolutely qualified, sentient being. I have all the characteristics. 84,000 clashes, I got all of them. I got the full set. A body that stinks and is defiled and unclean and so forth, that's mine. You know, it's just 100% sentient being, of course, from that perspective. But at least empty of inherent nature. And then I imagine, knowing that I'm not inherently a sentient being, then I imagine taking on the identity and the appearance of Atrasattva, even though in the back of my mind I know, it's, I know it's not true. But it'll be true one day. And after all, if time is not absolutely real, then maybe this should be okay. Right? Now, in this Galupa approach, the Galupas, my knowledge is very, very limited you know, in, in terms of comparing Sakya and Kaikyu and Yuma and so forth. But the Galupas, my goodness, when they, the great ones like Kidupje, for example, when he goes into stage of generation, like on Kala Chakra, and the stage in the mandala, and the different layers, body, speech, and mind mandala, and so forth. Man, it's like a person developing, you know, designing a new, a new Mercedes Benz. I mean, it just, it's so, so high-tech, so precise, so, like, awesome, you know, the precision of it. And then how do you develop each of these aspects? And what is the culmination of developing, practicing stage regeneration in Kala Chakra? Kedobje, my goodness, he's a master. Volume after volume of this. And Songaba, the whole tradition says, if you're practicing Kala Chakra, if that's your vehicle, then you have to master it. Completely master it. So, for example, when you really master it in Kala Chakra, you should be able to visualize the entire mandala, body, speech, mind mandala, with 720 deities inside an orb of light in your heart. All of it inside, like the universe in a single grain. You should be able to do that simultaneously inside an orb of light and hold it for four hours. Okay, so they really mean it. This is, this is heavy duty. But then if you do that, your whole energy system is so perfectly tuned for stage of completion. You go into stage of completion, you, you finish pretty quickly, and then you're a Buddha. Right? Well, and that's always operating out of that perspective of being a sentient being. Right? And frankly, pretending as if you're Buddha, by skillful means, right? That's what Tsongkhapa says. I've not seen him deviate from that anywhere. In contrast to that, in Dzogchen, you are the abducted child. You are a Buddha. You are a Buddha. It's not potential. This is Longchenpa's Buddha perspective versus Tsongkhapa's sentient being perspective. So says the Dalai Lama. And neither one is superior, to, superior better to, better than the other one. For some people, Tsongkhapa's approach will be more suitable, more effective. Other people, Longchenpa's approach will be more suitable, more effective. And they're complementary, and Tsongkhapa himself basically said that. When he said that Dzogchen is you know, complete, nothing excess, nothing deficient, and it's complete, then there's no higher praise than that. And then he just said, that's all he got to say. And then he did what he needed to do. You know. So, as we'll see, stage of generation, stage of completion in the Dzogchen context... It's really simple, as we'll see. It's really simple. And none of that incredible sophistication and complexity that you find in the Galooper approach to stage regeneration. And why? Because you don't need it. Because you're actually dropping in as soon as possible, as early on the path as possible, dropping into the perspective of being Buddha, not pretending as if, as a skillful ploy, as like a, uh, like a sublime placebo, but actually melting your perspective right down to Rikpa and practicing stage regeneration from that perspective. 
So you want to get the pointing out instructions as soon as you can. But of course, to hold them, you need shamatha. Otherwise, you get it and you drop it. So, one more parable on this notion, but he just gave, that was a very short story. It's all about pointing out instruction. In an instant, thus in an instant, he arose in the royal family of the entire region and all the subject experienced joy and happiness. You get the pointing out instructions, and in that instant, your perspective, it does, it's not in an instant you've now achieved all the qualities of Buddhahood. In an instant, you've melted right through your perspective of being a sentient being, substrate consciousness, and right down to the ground. That's in an instant. In an instant, you identify your own nature, your own, your own identity, as being Buddha. Because it was already true. And I just cut through to it. Okay, so we'd run parable, and we'll go to the meditation. This is the one I was looking forward to. The parable is more, a little more than a story than just a kid was kidnapped and then he was found. The parable of the old man losing his cord. This one's memorable. In one region, there once lived an old man and woman. At the bottom of a valley, a great spectacle was taking place, and the old woman encouraged her husband to go see it. Now you know it's coming. Right? I might mistake myself for someone else, he replied, so I'm not going. He's a little bit, you know, mine's a bit wobbly. He's an old man, you know, not so clear. So, I don't know, I might, I might get confused, Mama. I might get confused. And then, she, but his wife is kind of like, she's hard ass. She says, you won't make that mistake if you fasten an identification sign on yourself. <laughs> like, hello, my name is Tenzin. If, <laughs> if I seem lost, <laughs> my home is over there. <laughs> Except for it's not a five year old, it's an 85 year old. <laughs> hello. Where am I? So just wear the sign, it's quite cute. <laughs> Okay, so she so retorted, tying a purple cord on his leg. <laughs> At least around his neck would be nice. But okay, she put it on his leg. You know, my name is Tenzin. <laughs> and she sent him on his way. She wanted to have a good time, you know, let the little geezer have some fun. Getting carried away by the spectacle, he left the cord on his leg be cut off. Uh-oh. Then mistaking himself for someone else, he went around asking other people, Hey, who am I? Who am I? <laughs> I can really, you know, I might be doing this one day, so help me out. (laughs) This may be me in a few years, I don't know. These other replied, you, (laughs) these other people replied, you moron, (laughs) you're yourself. (laughs) But he didn't recognize himself. Eventually he ran into his wife and complained to her, this morning I told you I would go and mistake myself for someone else, but you didn't listen. (laughs) It's your fault. (laughs) that I didn't recognize myself. And he was on the verge of beating the old woman. (laughs) The deity will show you your nature. Make homage to the deity, she said. And she made him bow many times to the deity. After a while, he became exhausted and fell asleep. Because he still didn't know who he is. And while he was sound asleep, she fastened another purple cord on his leg and left it there. He woke up and said, Now here I am. (laughs) And so he recognized himself. Even when the old man did not recognize himself after the cord was cut off, there was no reason for his confusion. While he was present in his own identity, he became confused about something about which there was no reason to be confused. That's the parable. To explain the parable, very briefly, and we'll go to meditation. To explain the parable just as the old man initially became confused about something about which there was no reason to be confused, while the ultimate reality of your mind is primordially present as the Dharmakaya, you wander in samsara due to not recognizing it. Just as the old man recognized himself, once a cord was tied to his leg, so you see your own face of the Dharmakaya due to being introduced to it by means of the oral instructions of a guru. And this eradicates the basis for wandering in samsara. So, I could, I could really linger here. It's so rich, but very briefly. This whole theme is rather mysterious. I mean, there ha- has to be a reason, so it's no longer mysterious. Why on this Dzogchen path? We really know it's Dzogchen. Uh, on this Dzogchen path, we have the that first stage of the Vidyadhar is way up there in the path of seeing, the first Arya Bodhisattva level, right? And, what, and if we just look at the Dujum Lingba, the approach there, 
It's shamade vipassana, and then tektu. That's it. You can augment it if you wish with stage regeneration, stage regeneration, but you don't have to. And still you're able to move through those. And they don't say, oh, by the way, if you don't do stage regeneration completion, it'll take you one countless eon. They don't say that at all. No, 13 of his disciples, a thousand of his disciples, it became vijadatas. I mean, it's absolutely astonishing. And so how is it that his disciples were able to move right through path of accumulation, path of preparation so quickly? Well, clearly, very early on, they had the point in the instructions. And so there they are on the path of accumulation. Now, it's not an unmediated realization of rikpa, but they are, to the best of their ability, proceeding in the practice from the perspective of rikpa. They're meditating on emptiness from the perspective of rikpa. They're gaining insight into emptiness from the perspective of rikpa. And so it's that, a very subtle mind realizing emptiness all the way through, and that is slipping into the wormhole. That is slipping into the, you know, the warp drive and moves you right through it in a matter of maybe quite years, just years, you know. It's because you're not still dropping your anchor in the sentient being's mind and pretending as if you're a Buddha, even if you realize the emptiness of your own inherent nature as a sentient being. No, you know that, but you've dropped your anger down to the ground, and that's your platform, right through the passive accumulation and preparation. And that's why you can cut through it so quickly. And the culmination, of course, is when, as a fully matured vidyatara, you have an unmediated, conceptually unveiled, non-dual realization of rikpa, excuse me, of emptiness, and the awareness that is ascertaining emptiness is rikpa, and that too is realized without mediation. Then you have vidyatara. So having achieved the first of the, of the ten Aryabodhisattva levels, now you're really ready. So many people are doing leap over, you know, and they don't have any shamatha, hardly any understanding of emptiness. And, but they find some Mahalama will teach them leap over or the direct crossing over. That's fine. I have no criticism. But according to Yangta Namachi and all the teachings I've received, the people really suitable for leap, for the direct crossing over, are the ones who can dwell in Rukba. And clearly, if this is, and it is, it's the direct crossing over from one Bhumi to another, if you've not achieved any Bhumis, if you're way down there, even before the path of accumulation, then where are you leaping into an into a chasm, I don't know where you're leaping. But if you've achieved the first Arya Bodhisattva level, then with this very simple practice, and Yangta Namachi said, what, 20 to 20, 30 years, wasn't it? 20 to 30 years. If, you've, if you're fully qualified, you really are, are capable of dwelling in Rikpa, I'm going to give a gold standard. You can always, you can always, you know, bring it down. The gold standard, you're a Vididhara, you know, you're dwelling in Rikpa without mediation. Then he said 20 to 30 years. What would otherwise be two countless eons? From the first Bhumi to the eighth, one countless eon. From the eighth to Buddhahood, one countless eon. We can't even imagine that number of lifetimes. But if you've become Vidyadhara, baby Vidyadhara, first level Vidyadhara, then a 20, according, according to Yandra Nabhaji, who speaks from profound realization, then in 20, 30 years you're finished. Practice Tritgil, the direct crossing over. 20, 30 years. You're a Buddha. Okay. So, it's a different path. Different path. Okay. So now I've told my story. I've fulfilled my vow. Please find a comfortable position and we will proceed into meditation. So we just followed the pith instructions of Atisha, the speech emanation of Padmasambhava, the late one Vajra. He said, in one session on one cushion, practice the fivefold practice. We just did it. There was every aspect of it in one 24-minute session. I was just reading, so I had nothing to contribute there. But it just struck me like that was like a five-part symphony, just all woven together, but all integrated in 24 minutes. You might want to do that again. You know. So, there it is. So wonderful to be following in the footsteps of such masters as Atisha, Padmasambhava, Kamachame. So now, we go back to page 264. And he will now give a point-by-point explanation of the fivefold practice. 
as taught by Pamudupa and by Jigden Sumgun, two of the greatest Mahamudra masters in all of Tibetan history. So here's the summary of it. And by the way, at your leisure, absolutely read Gatchatamuchi's oral commentary. It's very, very helpful. So we begin. We begin with the, um, the practice of deity, deity yoga, which as we see here is, is, includes both stage regeneration and completion. Right? The stage of regeneration was that first part of generating the mandala, not even the mandala, just the deity, and the various visualizations we did, reciting the mantra, has the bodily aspect to it, the visualization, the appearance aspect to it, but then meditating on the empty nature, the empty nature, that is the, the empty nature of yourself as the deity, of the form of the deity, and so forth, the empty nature is then in the Dzogchen context. That's a state of completion. You don't need to do a lot of tsaolung and very arduous breathing techniques, visualization techniques. In the context of Dzogchen, that suffices. Right? So we go to deity yoga. If you do not meditate on a deity, if you don't engage in deity yoga, there will be obstacles. Well, if that was true in the 17th century in Tibet, I think we can count on that being all the more true now. Mistaking your own identity. Well, now you've got those parables we just, just had. You know, the old man who forgot who he was. The child who was abducted didn't know who he was. Mistaking your own identity, taking very seriously that you really are a sentient being, and then reifying that. Mistaking your own identity, using that as a platform for your practice. Oh, how can I become? How can I achieve this? How can I achieve that? Mistaking your own identity, even if you practice for your, for your whole life, your practice is said to be lacking in gratitude, and it will go astray. Such an interesting word, but lacking in gratitude. It's like it's the uh, par- one parable often used, and we've already seen it, is that stone that was you know, kind of crusty, dirty, and beneath the, beneath the layers of under a pillow. That, in fact, was the inheritance of the family. The father died, and he left them an inheritance. Right? They didn't bother to look <laughs> you know, so they were dying of poverty. They didn't bother to look. It's kind of like ungrateful. I left you. The, I left. You, I left it for you right there, right under your pillow, where you'd be sure to see it. And you didn't even bother to look. Isn't that kind of ungrateful? Ungrateful to your own Buddha nature. So, if you just continue insisting that you're a sentient being, you will go astray. Without a chosen deity, so I'll just stick with that. It's personal deity, chosen deity. Nobody, there's no homogeneity of translation of Ishta Devata, which literally means sh- chosen deity, and Yidam in Tibetan. Without a chosen deity, Tara Majushri, whoever it may be, without a chosen deity, you, m- you remain an ordinary person. And without meditating on a deity, you will not at- attain spiritual awakening no matter what practice you do. In this context, he's not dismissing Theravada and so forth and saying, in this, you picked up a book on Mahamudra and Dzogchen. If you are continuing to sustain your platform as an ordinary sentient being, and you're trying to practice Mahamudra Dzogchen, you'll, you'll, you'll not achieve the awakening no matter what you do. This is the sutra tradition, and it requires three countless eons to reach awakening. That's it. Your platform is being a sentient being. That's how long it takes. By meditating on a deity, bishachas, and you can check that out the, 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 in the Tibetan tradition, going back to India, they have so many subdivisions of different types of spirits that I ran out of words in English really quickly. We have spirit and ghost and demon and... Hmm? Fairy. Can't hear? Fairy. Seri? Fairy. 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 They're not demons. <laughs> well, what fairy tales were you reading? They're nice. You know, these are the nasty ones. Fairies. If she didn't look like English, I'd say she's Irish. Leprechauns? Leprechauns? Do I hear any leprechauns? <laughs> the witches have so many classes. You know, like we have words for elementary particles. Most people don't see them, but, you know, if you know how to see them. In any case, this particular class, and you can see a footnote describes them, uh, a particular class of these kind of malevolent entities are pacified by meditating on a deity. They, they calm down. And then among the five poisons, all lusty people, strong craving and attachment, are brought under your influence. Appearances are mastered. Because med- meditating on a deity, you're generating pure perception, pure perception. Appearances are mastered, so you're not sucked into just ordinary appearances generated by karma and then reifying everything. So appearances are mastered. And the primordial consciousness of discernment, 
one of the five facets of primordial consciousness, arises. That, of course, we had lusty people, people strong attachment and, and craving. There's one of the five poisons. When you see its essential nature right down to the ground, it is nothing other than, or it is an expression of, the primordial consciousness of discernment. Passions are sublimated, especially all of those related to desire and craving. You attract followers of others, and you do not mistake your own identity. So, that's, he's loaded an awful lot into that one paragraph. But among the five practices, there, there is a very, very dense quintessential account of the indispensability of deity yoga on this path, where the fivefold practice is needed you know, to complement the Mahamudra. Then there's Mahamudra. And the Mahamudra, remember, that's that non-conceptual. You remember earlier? Not that non-conceptual meditation. It's the view of, view of non-conceptuality, the fourth one. Okay? View of non-conceptuality. That's Mahamudra. Without Mahamudra, there is no liberation from samsara. Even though you strive in dharma and spiritual practice, you achieve nothing more than the mere pleasures of gods and humans. That is, the, that is practicing the yana, or the vehicle, of gods and humans. And by so doing, you are unable to be a blessing to others. So this Mahamudra, of course, includes meditation and emptiness. It includes the awakening or the identification of Rikpa. And if your Vajrayana practice, all the visualizations, the deity yoga and all of that, if it's not imbued with a, a lot more than lip service, but some with, with, if it's not imbued with some genuine insight into emptiness, then all the visualization, all the mantras, all of that, without insight into emptiness, it's... Good karma. Enjoy being a deva, because that's where it's going to propel you. It is, or you know, beautiful human being, maybe a gorgeous, famous, powerful human being, you know. But that's where it will lead you. Without, it doesn't lead beyond samsara. This is why the indispensability of Mahamudra. By meditating on Mahamudra, among the five poisons, delusion is sublimated. Nagas are pacified. Apparently, according to Dr. Yudhamaji, we have nagas up on the land there. So, bring your naga repellent when you come up. And <laughs> we'll need to do eventually some puja to make, not subdue them, but kind of like, you know, make peace with the nagas up there. So, nagas are pacified, which means that's a nice word. They're pacified, like if they're kind of upset. Oh, okay, these people are cool. You're liberated from, from samsara. This is the key insight into emptiness. Uh, is the key, of course, and the primordial consciousness of the absolute space of phenomena is realized. Dharma Datu. You become a master of samsara and nirvana, and the dharmakaya and svabhavakaya are attained. Thus, the meditations on the bodily stage of generation of your chosen deity, so we just did that, right? And the mental stage of completion concerning the meaning of emptiness, are to be practiced by a novice during the earlier and later phases of the meditative meditation session. That's what we just did, right? So, it's really quite, it's so simple, but it's so elegant. Once you're accustomed to that, meditate on them in union. So, appearances and emptiness. Appearance and luminosity and emptiness. Luminosity and emptiness. Luminosity manifesting as yourself as a deity, the flowing of light and so forth, and all of that suffused with the inside at emptiness. Do them simultaneously. So first you do them sequentially, as we did. You do them sequentially. First the visualization, your, ident- your identity is Avalokiteshvara and so forth. And then you slip over, you get, you get a little bit tired of visualization, then release that, go into the emptiness of your mind. So now you're doing stage of completion, and then unite the two. This is a central theme of the understanding of stage of generation and completion in the Dzogchen tradition. Nyingma generally is that the whole point then is finally you're, you're practicing them simultaneously and indivisibly. So it's a different approach. It's a different approach than the, this very classic, uh, majestic approach that you find in the Galupa tradition, where there's so much deal, there's one heck of a lot of hard work to be done. So once, you're, once you are accustomed to that, meditate on them in union, for that is the main practice taught in the secret mantra of Vajrayana, Thus it is said, equally establishing the two stages of the stage of generation and the stage of completion is the teaching of the Buddha. 
So we've covered two. We've covered the deity yoga and the Mahamudra. Now we move on. The best way to dispel interferences, all those obstacles, all those hassles, all those problems that arise in the path. Well, the best way to dispel interferences and enhance the main practices, juice them, empower them, of the stages of generation and completion is Guru Yoga. So this is crucial. I've never seen any text in Dzogchen that does anything more than say this is absolutely indispensable, it's the core of the practice. Emphasize this as the centrality of your practice of Dzogchen, the Guru Yoga. If you do not meditate on this, you will not realize the mind state of your Guru. You will not receive blessings, you will not have experiential realizations, and even your own followers will have no reverence or devotion. So if you set the, the lead standard of not really having Guru Yoga for your own Gurus, and eventually you have some disciples of your own, well, they'll have the same lack of reverence for, for you if you have your own teachers. Karma ripens quickly. By meditating on your Guru, pride is sublimated. Devaputras, another class of these spirits, are pacified. And now we have another of the five poisons, Jealous people, jealousy or envy, jealous people are brought under your influence. Awareness is apprehended. You recognize your own mind as Dhammakaya, and you are blessed. The, primor- the primordial consciousness of equality arises. There again in terms of pride. The root of pride stems from the primordial consciousness of equality when you see its essential nature right down to the ground. You're honored by everyone and you attain the state of your guru. It's so interesting, this the complete symmetry between inside and outside. And that is your own jealousy is sublimated, dissolves into the primordial consciousness of equality. But as inside, so outside, then people around you that you perceive as jealous, they're brought into your, brought into your influence. So it makes it very clear that they're not other than you. you know. So now we've covered three, right? We have two more. Bodhicitta. The cultivation of bodhicitta is initially important for the attainment of enlightenment. So it is like a seed. In the interim, it is like water and fertilizer. And finally, it is like a bountiful harvest. If this is not cultivated, even if you devote your whole life to Dharma, you veer off to the Hinayana states of the Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas, and you do not attain the fruition of spiritual awakening, of Buddhahood. You do not attract a monastic following, and even if you do attract followers, they get involved in quarrels, strife, and bickering. Of course, what... The bodhicitta is fundamentally counteracting, eradicating, is self-centeredness. The sense of the prioritization, the priority of one's own well-being over that of others. And it should be absolutely clear, this sense of me first, of my well-being being more important, can, can come into business. It's kind of standard business. It's absolutely standard in politics. It's standard in competitive, competitive activities of all kinds. I want to win, I want to win, right? It's just everywhere in the mundane world. But that same attitude, cleaned up a little bit, then can be the motivation for spiritual practice. Me first, me first, me first. You know. We see it on a very crude level, it's almost comic, when the great Lama, like his holiness Dalai Lama, is giving initiation to 100,000 people. And then they pass out the sacred, you know, the strings, for example. And you see the Tibetans piling over each other, you know, like it's a mob, like it's a rugby, a rugby tournament. You know, they're jumping each other. It's really kind of gross, frankly. Uh, you know, me, 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 I, I don't know, look at you know, elbows and so forth. At least there's no gunfire. That's always a good sign. But, uh, you know, it's just, it's just human beings. I'm not criticizing Tibetans. I mean, just, it's what people do if they've not really developed bodhicitta. But then not having bodhicitta and going for a Kala Chakra empowerment is kind of like, Okay, odd. And so, so if you have not overcome the self-centered prioritization of your own well-being, and then if you have followers, they're going to engage with each other, 
corresponding to your own self-centeredness. People engage in quarrels because they're self-centered. They have strife with each other because they're self-centered. They bicker because they're self-centered. Due to cultivating bodhicitta, hatred is sublimated. Another of the five poisons, of course. And now, more technical classes of, of these spirits. Pattivas and grahas are pacified. And all hateful people are brought under your influence. The needs of the world are fulfilled. Mirror-like primordial consciousness arises. Your followers come together in harmony. And you accomplish the result of various Nimanakayas. So, when he was speaking about this, is really classic Mahayana teachings. The bodhicitta is indispensable in the beginning, in the middle, and in the end. Remember when I was receiving Geshe Rapton's biography? He's coming to the end. He told me his whole life story. He was born as a a child on a ranch, his mother passed away. So it, was, it really reminded me, for, for uh, people at Mary Kay, you'll get this, um, what's it called? Ponderosa. What was that? What's the movie? Bonanza. Bonanza. Is that what that was? It's Pa and Hoss and Little Joe and Adam, you know. It's, it was, it was, I mean, I was, when I was hearing his life story, I said, this is Ponderosa. It's Dad and his boys. There were no girls around. And it was a ranch. I mean, these were kambas. Well, if there's ever a cowboy's cowboy, American cowboys could learn something from the kambas. You know, the American cowboy is a little bit wimpy. They wanted to learn real machismo. I mean, go to kam. Oh, those, those guys were tough. So Geshe Rapna was born as a cowboy. You know? And then, real renunciation. A fantastic story. What a, what such a wonderful story. I could spend the rest of the afternoon on that one. But he told me his whole story. Uh, we left home at 19 and went through tremendous hardships, unbelievable hardships. And then earning his Geshe degree and then having to flee and coming down to India and so forth. And, you know, and then he's coming towards the end of his story, uh, where he's wound up, you know, at the culmination of his career, living in a little cow shed, you know, and meditating on emptiness. But then he came to Bodhicitta. Some of you have told this story before. You'll remember it. It's, it's very memorable. And uh, he said, well, after these years and years of study and practice and debating and all of this, I've come to a very firm conclusion that uh, all of Dharma practice, in, within the context of Buddha Dharma, all the teachings, they feel that fall into one of three categories. Everything, every aspect of the teachings, with no exceptions, all of the teachings are either preparation for cultivating bodhicitta, they are the cultivation of bodhicitta, or they're the fruition of cultivating bodhicitta. And he said, if any of you disagree, come and debate with me. <laughs> it was so much fun. So he was saying the same thing as Kama Shamed is saying here. And he chuckled. He chuckled. Oh, he's going to like, nobody's going to come, but if they did, I'd win. <laughs> So, spiritual practice is like a fine horse on which you place a saddle and bridle. And now we have dedication. Oh, here we are. The fifth one. Right? Then we're finished. Spiritual practice is like a fine horse on which you place a saddle and bridle, and the dedication is like directing the horse with the reins, so that it goes wherever you wish. So this is important. Without the dedication, you do not attain the results that you desire. Even if you briefly attract a following, they fall under someone else's influence. They stray. They wander off. If you practice the dedication, jealousy is sublimated. Nagas and Tsin are pacified. Jealous people. That's it. I think we already covered that one. I wonder if it's, a, if it's a typo on his part. Jealous people. What's left over? Ego. Pride. We didn't cover... Do we have pride already? Yes. So jealous, jealous people are brought under control. Oh, we can't get them brought, brought under control. The roots of your virtue are not misdirected. The, the, oh, here with this it is. This, this is jealousy because of the primordial consciousness of accomplishment. And that's, that's, and the, and the, that's the root for jealousy. Yeah? Envy, envy. And your followers do not fall under the influence of others. Now, those are the five. He just gave, gave it, you know, paragraph by paragraph account of why each one is so important, the significance of one. But then he's going to add on to that. If you're practicing Dzogchen, then add a, fifth, a, a sixth element, 
And of course, according to the Yangjana, but you add this, of course, if you really are able to listen to Rikpa, otherwise you're just looking at little floaters in your field of vision. If you do not meditate on the direct, on the clear light leap over, or nowadays they say crossing over, the practice of the nine yanas is not complete, and the practical instructions on liberation through observation are not received. You're left with a view entailing the grasping of mental analysis, and when delusive appearances of the intermediate state arise, it will be difficult to recognize them. This is the intermediate state of the, the bardo of dhammata, the bardo of dhammata, just before the bardo of becoming begins. If the clear light leap over is constantly observed, your view is not left in mental analysis, the five facets of primordial consciousness are directly perceived. In the best of cases, you directly encounter the assembly of the peaceful and wrathful deities. That's in the bardo of Dhammata, ultimate reality. Even if you do not meet them, when you encounter them in the intermediate state, you may encounter them while you're still alive. Even if not, when you encounter them in the intermediate state, specifically the bardo of the Dhammata, you will identify them and certainly be liberated. And that's said to be liberated by way of Sambhogakaya, by, by the way. The practice of the nine yanas is thoroughly complete. Planetary spirits are pacified. The dakinis and dharma protectors take care of you as if you were their own child. And finally, you attain the rainbow body, specifically the great transference rainbow body of the Dhammakaya. You, so, you soon see extraordinary, radiant, lustrous bindus of rainbow light. And when you see them, that is the vision of the direct perception of ultimate reality. And that's the first of the four visions. And that corresponds to a fully matured Vitadana. Okay. The benefits are taught in the secret tantra of the sun of the blazing clear expanse of the Dakinis. All the Buddhas of the three times, the families of the Sugatas, the three families, the five families of Sugatas, the three families of protectors, and peaceful and wrathful Dakinis and Viras are seen by means of direct perception. Karmic, and this is a result of the leap over practice. Karmic obscurations and habitual propensities are extinguished. A contemplative who sees this no longer has the names of the three realms of samsara and the three worlds below on the surface and above the surface of the earth are ascertained. For you who see this place of liberation just once, as soon as the transitional process of becoming arises, you'll undoubtedly take miraculous rebirth in a natural Nirmanakaya realm. No longer has the names of the three realms of samsara. You've utterly transcended them, so it's transcended the three realms, desire, form, formless realm, so not even the names of them remain. Totally transcended. Thus, it is crucial to engage in constant practice of these six. Your chosen deity, Mahamudra, your guru, Bodhicitta, the clear light, clear light here refers to the direct crossing over, and the dedication. Whether you remain in retreat for 13 years, 6 years, a 3 year and 3, three fortnight cycle, a month, 3 weeks, 2 weeks, or even 1 week, this is the practice. So some of you have been asking me about what should you do or what should you do after this retreat's over. I think he just told you. Mm-hmm. Right? In terms of your regular schedule, whether you have each day 4 sessions, 3 sessions, 2 sessions, in the morning and evening, or even 1 session per day, you should meditate on this. So I think Karma Chamedra Machi is your guru here. He's giving you very explicit advice, guidance. And you know, what do you do from here? In what way, and now I'm going to read through this uh, because I took out just the pith instructions. Now this will be familiar, so just relax. In what way do you engage in that meditation? It is best to sit upon a comfortable cushion in the posture bearing the seven attributes of Varochana. If you cannot do so, it is enough to sit in the six-fold fastened stove posture. Does anybody have a clue what that is? <laughs> I don't. Gatron which probably explained it 20 years ago, but I don't. No, I didn't, I didn't explain it here. So, find somebody wiser than I. Throw a stone in any direction. And, you know, just bump into somebody in Pisa. What's that six-fold fastened stove? Wallace didn't know. Can you tell me? Somebody can tell you. And now for the practice itself. Consider, alas, everything is of nature of impermanence. Today I must engage in truly satisfying spiritual practice. What does tomorrow hold in store? Cultivate a fine motivation, thinking for the sake of all sentient beings, I shall attain perfect spiritual awakening. In order to do so, I shall practice the profound stages of generation and completion. 
With that motivation, clearly visualize your body in the form of the great compassionate one. The color of your body is white, like an autumnal moon. Your one face is calm and smiling. You are adorned with this precious crown of jewels, and your Guru Amitabha is present on the top of your head. You have four hands, the first two pressed together at your heart, your lower right hand holding a rosary of white crystal, and your left, lower left hand holding an eight-petaled white lotus blossom. You wear a shawl, lower garment, and skirt of various silks, and the hide of Krishna Shara antelope is draped over your left shoulder. All of this, of course, is purely symbolic. Imagine that you're seated upon a moon disk in the center of a variegated lotus with your legs in the Vajra Asana. A white syllable Hri stands upright in the center of a moon disk at your heart, inside your body, which is inwardly hollow and immaculate. On the periphery of that disk, the white six syllables circle about in a clockwise direction. From them, rays of various colors, rays of light of various colors are emanated out in the direct, ten directions like rays of a rainbow. All the gurus, chosen deities, buddhas and bodhisattvas dwelling in the ten directions and the three times come floating in like snowflakes in a blizzard. All your primary and lineage gurus dissolve into the lord of the family, Amitabha, thereby synthesizing all your gurus. All the chosen deities, Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, dissolve into yourself as the great compassionate one, thereby synthesizing all the chosen deities. Their root mantras, essential syllables and secondary syllables, all dissolve into the six syllables at your heart, thereby synthesizing all mantras, vidya mantras and dharanis. Meditate on this not just once, but with great earnestness. This is practical advice for accomplishing everything with one guru, one deity, and one mantra. And again, of course, I, I can't help but remember Atisha's ironic comment towards the Tibetans. He says, we, we Indians, we meditate on one deity and we realize a hundred. You Tibetans, you meditate on a hundred deities and you don't even realize one. Just the sheer fact that, you know, when you, in Tibetan, I, mean, I lived in Tibetan culture for years, and uh, when they'd speak of, you know, we, we all took, I mean, pretty much all of us took empowerments back then and received commitments, commitments for life to recite for Yasada in this old timers like Kathy, you know what I'm talking about, yeah. We all did, pretty much. And so, you have a commitment, you made a promise, you're going to recite this every day for the rest of your life. And if you're on your deathbed and you can't speak, then you invite somebody over to recite it on your behalf. If your mouth can't move or your mind is just too fuzzy, invite somebody else to recite it in your hearing so you can kind of mentally recite along with them. So it's kind of a serious, a serious commitment here. And then, but, but then, you know, really earnest Dharma practitioners, a lot of monks, pretty much all the tukus, and a lot of other serious practitioners, they'll receive not one empowerment, They'll receive two, and then three, and then five, and then ten. Uh, some of you received all the empowerments of Dutram Lingba, right? I have two from, uh, from, Lama, from, Lama, from a Lama who came from Tibet. The, the son of one of the five emanations of Dutram Lingba. Mm -hmm. So, but then if you receive multiple ones, like Guya Samaja, and Radha Yugini, and Yamantaka, and Chakra Samvara, and so forth, then for each one of them you have to do Sadhana. So I knew one Geshe, really good, really good monk, really good teacher. His holiness had great respect for him. And he had eight hours of recitations he had to do every day. And he was full, he ran a Dharma center and he was teaching and so forth. And so, you know, when he'd finished everything he had to do for his Dharma center and teaching and so forth, then he'd go into his room and he would practice his sadhanas for eight hours straight right through the night. And the Tibetans call it kandun, kandun, uh, oral recitation, because it's so easy. You know, when you got all of these things, you have to get through them. You have to get through them. Oh my goodness, I was off. You know, I, I just got off the airplane, or I went to home meetings, or I was at conferences all day, and I haven't done any of my commitments. Oh my goodness, I got to get through them before I pass out, before I fall asleep. So I'll do my kandun, and then. Okay, here we go. Okay, no, 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 no,
It's called Kandana, it's called oral recitation. Now for that Geshe, by the way, I'm very happy to say his name, Geshe, if I can remember it, from, from Long Beach. Yeah, Gansen. Gansen. What's his first name? Sudan Gansen. He's not one of my gurus, but I translated him for him once or twice. Really nice Geshe. Yeah? So he looked on the outside like just a really good Geshe. Like Geshe Zopa. Like just really good Geshe. Right. And then when Sudan Gansen really passed away, not too many years ago, then he either passed away in India or somehow his, his body, they, they cremated his body there. And uh, they cremated it on the, the banks of the Ganges, as I recall. And uh, they're big, you know, the, a lot of wood. So it's a really hot fire. Because they want to burn that body down to, you know, down to fine ash. And so they put his body in. I know this from people who were there. And they burned his body down to fine ash so that even his vajra and bell, which they put into the fire, melted. And then when it was all finished, the fire died down, it was all cooled. Three body parts hadn't burned. His eyes, his tongue, and his heart had not burned. So all of that, melting butter and bell, eyes, tongue, and heart. Namanakaya, Sambhogakaya, Dharmakaya did not burn. So he wasn't such an ordinary Geshe after all. And Geshe, and Geshe Zuppa, based for decades, up in Wisconsin, I think a lot of people, certainly scholars, but a lot of people, I thought, oh, just a really good Geshe. He really knows the books, really knows the books. Lived a long life. He passed away. I think a number of people were surprised when he remained seven days in the clear light of death. So hidden yogis, hidden yogis. So outwardly, it looks like they're just doing kandu, and inwardly, they must be doing something more than that. So, oh yeah. So that's so... But this is a way. Focus on one yidam. If you, couldn't, if you have to choose one, you probably can't do better than Ava, Avalokiteshvara. One guru. If you have to choose one guru and you have faith, you can't do any better than his only Dalai Lama. He is generosity, so that's easy. One mantra, Om Mani Pei Mehung. Problem solved. <laughs> oh, that's all. Then the seed syllables emit rays of light while they're circling about, transforming the entire external universe into the realm of Sukhavati and transforming all sentient beings who dwell in the six states of existence into forms of the Great Compassionate One. Gloriously visualize everyone you see as being in the form of Great Compassionate One. Even if you cannot maintain that clearly, imagine that they are the Great Compassionate One. That is the transformation of appearances into the Divine Body, and if that is clear, it is all right even if you do not complete your retreat. With regard to seeing other people and so on while in retreat, this is practical advice for not incurring the fault of breaking your retreat. So people, retreat, you know, it's best to keep really strict retreat, but if somebody comes in, then if you simply view them as Avalokiteshvara, then you haven't broken your retreat. If you see them as ordinary beings and respond as an ordinary being, then you just broke your retreat. Then if you recite the six syllables in a very loud voice, this will not do, and it will take a long time to accomplish anything, and if malevolent local spirits are present, they may harm you. Like, cut the racket, you, <laughs> you terrible neighbor. You know, they might not like it. If your voice is too soft, the syllables will be unclear, so their power will not emerge. Recite them clearly and purely with the humming sound of a bee. Imagine that while you're ch- chanting your song on your own, all sentient beings of the six states of existence are reciting together with you. Imagine all sounds of fire, of wind, of movement, and all voices are sounds of the six syllables. This is the transformation of sounds into divine speech. So you you transform all appearances into the divine body, all sounds into divine speech. If that is clear, even a single voice is multiplied many hundreds of millions of times. This is practical advice for accomplishing the state of an arya with a hundred mantras. If that is clear, it is all right even if you are not able to maintain silence. While you are in retreat, it is all right if it is mixed with talking, for all speech is the mantra. It is said that even if you're practicing with a rosary, this will make up for em- omissions and excesses. Om Mani Padme Hum is pretty easy to uh, recite, but the longer syllables, sometimes we screw them up, add syllables to subtract syllables. This purifies that. If your practice is good when you meditate on those points without wavering from the essential nature of the mind, that is the supreme union of the stages of generation and completion. 
That will happen once ideation arises as meditation. The stage of generation is ideation, ideation is the mind, and the mind is emptiness. The mind and ideation are like water and waves. So when that very movement arises as meditation, that is the union of the two stages of generation completion. If that union is beyond the capacity of novices, you should first meditate single-pointedly on the visualizations of the stage of generation. So there's the body part. You may get a little tired of those visualizations. The stillness of the mind with respect to the visualization is shamatha. By mentally vividly observing the mind of the meditator, you'll have a special vision of emptiness that is ungrounded in anything, and that is vipassana. Evenly settle your mind as stably as possible in that state. If thoughts flow out again, observe their essential nature and let them release themselves. That is the technique for experiential novices. Once you're accustomed to that, there's no need to watch the flow of the essential nature of thoughts, just as you might enjoy gazing at a sparkling clear lake in the springtime. Restfully observe the essential nature of the mind, simply and without distraction. Just as the waves emerge from the water and merge back into the lake, without harming the lake, even if a little movement emerges from the state of stillness, it does not harm the stillness, and it merges back into the state of stillness. Once you're accustomed to that, however many thoughts occur, they do not impair the stillness, but like snowflakes drifting down upon a lake, they merge into the experience of stillness. By acquainting yourself with that, thoughts will appear as meditation. When ideation does arise as meditation, that is the union of the stages of generation and completion. For the stage of generation is ideation. If the mind still has something to observe, it is not seeing its essential nature. Then unify the person who is observing and that which is being observed. You will then gain certain knowledge of a brilliant, serenely joyful, homogeneous emptiness, and there, will no, and there will no longer be anything onto which to grasp. There is nothing of which you can say, this is it, and there is nothing of which you can say, this is the meditation. This will be unlike anything you've experienced before, and doubts may arise. Be quiet, stop trying, and simply be undistracted without having anything to do. So now it's time for non-meditation. When that happens, the essential nature of ordinary consciousness will be seen. Ordinary consciousness is manifesting as rikpa. If the sentinel of mindfulness is lost, you'll wander off into confusion as usual. Simply do not lose the sentinel of undistracted mindfulness. That is the meaning of Jalopa's statement. If the mind has no intentional object, that is Mahamudra. If you become accustomed and well acquainted with that, supreme awakening will be attained. If you meditate without losing the sentinel of mindfulness, that is meditative equipoise. If the sentinel, sentinel of mindfulness is lost, you're no longer meditating. Right? Meditation is finished. That is the post-meditative state. So, as I said earlier, I think it was yesterday afternoon, here's a practice of non-meditation. Right? But if you lose it, you're not meditating incorrectly. You're no longer meditating. You're in the post-meditative state. So reboot and start the practice all over again of not, of not doing. Because there are not many ways of not doing. And if you tinge it even with a little bit of doing, you just ended the session. And then you can reboot and start another session. But when you're in the session, there's nothing to fix. That's the thing. There's nothing to fix. As soon as you even have the notion there's something to fix, where have you planted your sense of identity? Andre. Yep. Wanted to see whether you're listening. Yeah. What's that? Listen again. If you're practicing non-meditation and you have a sense that there may be something to fix, like laxity comes in or excitation comes in or what have you, if you're practicing in that way, what is your perspective? Exactly right. You know the answer. That's right. If you have any sense, oh, I'll need to fix something, then you're not resting in non-meditation. You're just sitting there like a marmot, you know, which is not even remotely Dzogchen, but it's not anything else either. This whole notion of open presence, choiceless awareness, and open monitoring and so forth, 
very profound if you're resting in rikpa. And if you're not resting in rikpa, it's not anything except for marmot meditation. It's not shamatha, it's not vipassana, it's not mahamudra, dzogchen. I don't think it's really Zen. It's just sitting there doing nothing. So this is why it's so crucial. Okay? So as soon as you start doing something, like fixing anything, or you just lose your mindfulness, you just stopped practicing. And then, if you wish, you can just you know, go for a walk, because you're already in the post-meditative state. You can continue in the post-meditative state, have a cup of tea. Or you can say, I think I'd like to go back to meditation, and then you go back into not doing again. Hola, so. That's it. So, from there we go to Guru Yoga. Moving right ahead. Emma Ho. Enjoy your evening. Now- Thank you.